Good morning. Welcome again to Deer Park's First Baptist Church Adult Bible Study. We're doing lesson number nine this morning from our material. The, the title of the lesson is The Discipline of Fasting. Let's, let's talk about the surrounding, what's happening here right now. Jesus had just come from Galilee out to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. And we know that that is then how it took place. But remember, John convinced, uh, Jesus convinced John to baptize him. And here we are. Jesus had just been baptized himself. As he came out of the water, the heavens opened, Scripture says, and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And then they heard this loud voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. What a beautiful picture we have there of, of Jesus' baptism. But it's all too true, guys, and many of you can testify to this fact that, that after the blessings comes the battle. After the blessings come the battle. Think about these contrasts between the glory following Jesus' baptism and the challenge to be tempted by the devil. Think of this, the cool water of the Jordan where he had just been baptized and now the barren wilderness out there. How about the huge crowd around the baptism of Jesus and those all coming for the baptism of repentance and now their solitude and silence out in that wilderness. It said the spirit rests like a dove and now the same spirit drives him into the wilderness. The voice of the Father calling him my beloved son. And now the, the hiss of Satan, the tempter. There's the contrast between being anointed at his baptism and now he being attacked. In the water of baptism, but now the fire of temptation. First the heavens opened. And now hell abounds all around Jesus with the arrival of Satan. You see, Jesus did not need to be tempted to help him grow. That wasn't the, that wasn't the point. He endured the temptation so he could identify with you and I. Hebrews 2, 18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. The Holy Spirit cannot tempt us. James 1.13 Let no one say when he is tempted I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone. Well, that, that is a very true statement, God. But the Holy Spirit may lead you to a place where we will be tempted. If we're not careful, we'll be led into a situation where we will be tempted. And Satan is all about that. You know... This is not to prove something to God about you and I. It is to prove something to us and to the spiritual being watching us. Think about that as we, as we go through this lesson. See, temptation is a certainty for everyone, guys. Yet Jesus was more severe than we're tempted with. He is tempted directly by Satan. We typically contend with lesser demons than than, than the master craftsman we call Satan. William Barclay says this about, about this incident about uh, testing here and, and, and temptation. He said it is more accurately translated the testing of Jesus than it is the temptation of Jesus. The Greek word used here means to test far more than it means to tempt in the sense of that word as we know it in English. Tempt in English had a bad meaning actually. 
Uh, you, you know, when you think about, when you go back and read the Old Testament about the incident of Abraham uh, about to sacrifice that, he said the Lord tempted Abraham. Well, <clears throat> we know that the, the, the tempting means to entice a man to do wrong, to entice him, to, to seduce him into sin, and also to try to persuade him to take the wrong turn. This is what temptation does. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not a pleasant word. The Jews had a saying, the Holy One, blessed be his name, does not elevate a man to dignity until he has first tried and searched him. And if he stands in temptation, then he raises him to dignity. So this is a, this is a Jewish saying, and like many Jewish sayings that, that we've read in here before. You see, what we call temptations today are designed not to make us sin, but they're meant to enable us to conquer sin in our lives. Temptations today are not meant to make us bad. They're meant to make us good. They're not meant to weaken us. They're meant to make us stronger. Many of us could testify to those things too, where we've been tempted to something and, and, we, and we conquered that, that temptation. And we know it made us stronger the next time Satan pops up, up one in front of us. So maybe as we go through here, we'll look at this incident as the testing of Jesus rather than the tempting of Jesus. You notice also where this temptation took place? Yeah, it was in the desert, the wilderness, actually a barren, uh, desert-like atmosphere. It's between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. The whole area there is, is what's called as wilderness. See, Jesus needed to be alone while he was being tested. Could it be, guys, that we often go wrong because we never try to be alone? In this techno world we have now, we have to be constantly doing something. We've either got to be texting, we got to be texting, we got to be calling, we got to we got to be doing something else on the computer, or iPad, or whatever it may be. But you know what? Uh, we just uh, we just don't want to be alone in our thoughts. Get along sometimes and, and have nothing going on. Have no computer, no TV, no nothing going on. Just you and your mind and God. And see what that will do in your life. See, there's some things we just have to work out on our own. There's not a magic formula for, for any of it. We just have to work it out on our own and with the, with the help of the Lord. Other people's advice either does not fit you exactly or, or it's just not the good for you at this point in your life. See, our mistake is not giving us a chance, ourselves a chance, to be alone with God. Well, if we could just do that, if we could pull apart those times, sit and meditate, and by all, listen for the word of God. Well, God never spoke to me. Maybe we never listened. Maybe we never, we, we didn't understand that part. That, that what went on in our life. Maybe if we just did those things. And Matthew 4, 1 through 4, just four verses in our text this morning. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered him, said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights. You see, there, there's, a, there's a track record for that, uh, that, that we understand that fasting in 40 is a popular 40 was a popular word, 40 was a popular time, whether it be months or years. And today, <clears throat> we know that Moses, when he went on the mountain to receive the law, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights on that mountain. We also know that Elijah fasted 40 days and 40 nights for the prophets. See, the spiritual discipline of fasting is a foreign concept to most of us. We just have a question about, is it, is, it a, is it a food thing? We just give up food? Is that what fasting is all about? Maybe, 
How long should one last? How long should one fast anyway? What am I doing a fast? And what is the point of a fast? See, fasting is not a magic formula, guys, to twist God's arm. But there is something significant that happens in the spiritual realm when we fast. It's letting go of the physical and let the spirit take control of your life. Now, does that make sense? It, do, it does to me. When we let go of our physical needs and concentrate on the spirit and allow the spirit to control our lives, things are going to be different for us, guys. It's going to be, in fact, it, it, it actually increases intimacy with God because you have zeroed in on God alone. And you're, you're listening, you're talking, uh, you're praying, and you're listening for his word in your life. So fasting is a real thing we do. Now, fasting, fasting is more prominent in the Old Testament. We know that. And it was not commanded to be done in the New Testament. However, it was expected in the disciples of Jesus set that example by fasting himself. And the church fasted. In Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, <clears throat> It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hand on them, they sent them away. See, they set the example for us. It was expected of the disciples. See, it's not a way, uh, see the motive and manner are crucial. This thing that the motive and manner are crucial, but the timing and length are optional. It, it, it's up to you. How long you feel like you need to you set yourself apart for God only, then that's optional for you. There's no there's no set time to do fasting. Another thing we have to remember, God, it's not a way of showing your spirituality. See, we're reminded of that in Scripture. It's, it's a way to draw closer to God and seeking His advice. But listen to what the admonition Jesus had about this. In Matthew 6, verse 16, it says, whenever you, it doesn't say you must fast. It says, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. They wanted you to know. They walk around with a jaw dropped down to their knees and, and poor me, Eeyore type guy, just walking around so that people would know their fasting, that they know their spiritual, how godly they were because they were fasting. They wanted you to know it. And Jesus said, don't do that. And he said this, truly, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Did you hear those last three words? As you fast and give God a place in your life, He will reward you. I don't know what that reward is, but the scripture quite out says it. Matthew chapter 6, verses 18. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So keep that in mind, guys, that we set aside to, to, to fast or to do it in our own way. As we talked already, 40, the familiar period of testing in the Bible. Now, it said that, that, that I read this and, and, uh, and heard it a couple other places that after about three to four days, maybe up to six or seven days, the severe hunger pain just go away. Now, I, I can't imagine. I've never, I've never done it. I've never fasted that long. But they say that the hunger pain just go away. And what happens then, but near the end of the 40 days, this hunger comes back with a vengeance. And what it's simply saying is, from a physical standpoint, you are nearing death. Because that's why the hunger pains come back so severely. And it's also said, for the you that would be interested, it says that you can expect to lose at least about 30 pounds in a 40-day fast. 
Well, that's up to you there. But just know that it's a long time. And so, so look at Jesus here. This was the end of the 40 days. He fasted and prayed for 40 days. Jesus was starving to death from a human standpoint. He's very near that death. He's got to be, he's got to be uh, really washed out at this point. Now, so what we see at this point, we're probably not as sharp as we need to be mentally. You and I are not. I, I don't think that happened to Jesus, but, but nonetheless, see, we are. That, see, temptations are launched in your mind, though. This is where, this is where we get tempted up here. It's not, it's not anywhere else. And you know it. It, uh, it said that it said to this day, you can see the ink stained wall in the church where Martin Luther threw his ink well at Satan, as Satan was tempting him in his mind. I don't know. I've never been there. I'd, I'd like. I'd love to see it someday, and maybe we will one day. Who knows? But but you see, Satan attacks us from within, not without. Have you ever noticed, too, we're attacked through our gifts, God-given gifts that we have, individuals? Satan attacks us that way. Think about this. If you're gifted with charm, you can use that charm to get away with anything. Oh, if you, you know, if you just see, a, a, you know, just someone that's got that kind of charm, they'll have you eaten out of their hand in 10, 15 minutes. And Satan says, you says, this charm is a good one. You can get out of this by using that charm. How about, are, are you gifted with many words? In other words, one of those silver-tongued devils. I don't know about you, but uh, those people will explain their way out of anything. I've known a few. I could tell you a few stories. I'm not going to, but I could tell you a few stories about being wild by those silver-tongued devils. Because they're gifted. Satan, use your gift here. You can talk your way out of this one. And also, if you have a vivid imagination, it will come there. Temptation will come through that vivid imagination. And notice also something else here. Who was actually telling us about this temptation? Well, it, it had to be Jesus, didn't it? It says he's alone. He and Satan in the desert. So somewhere along the line, there was Jesus out there in that wilderness by himself. He must have related his experience to the, to the disciples some way for them to know exactly how he dealt with Satan. And so, so we see now the first appeal or the first temptation was an appeal to the flesh. And it said, and the tempter came, oh boy, and the tempter came. You see, notice it's not a question if the tempter will come, but it's when he comes. Guys, you can expect it. We will face temptation if Jesus comes again. As you walk out of this building, you'll be tempted one way or the other to do something that, that the Satan has, has, got a, has got his foot in the door on something. It's not a matter if he will come. He will come. So just be prepared for it. And then he says, if you are God's son, how about this? And which, you know, we interpret as since you are God's son. And, but he says, if you are God's son. You see, right out of the box, Satan challenged the very thing God had just told Jesus. And, and you know, it, and, he, and he wants to challenge. He said, well, why are you so hungry? Why are you starving? Look, just do it. Make it happen. You can do it. You have the power to do it. You see, does that not mean the same thing to you and I, though? Don't we fall into that same trap? Satan uses those same tools on you and I. How about this one? Since I am a child of God, why is this happening to me? And since I'm a child of God, why are these bills piling up all over around me? Why is my electricity bill so high? I'm a child of the king. And since I'm a child of God, why do we stand in need all the time? Why am I needy all the time in my life? Satan does the same thing to us, guys. We do the same thing. That he challenged the very thing God had just said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
See, Satan, no, make no doubt about it. Satan knew Jesus the deity. There was no question about it. He knew who Jesus was. He knew Jesus was deity. And he was challenging him to prove it. Why don't you just, Jesus, go ahead. Perform a miracle here. Just do something with that. It was simply Satan telling Jesus. He, he had the right to do it. Satan, Jesus, you have the right. You have the power to do this. You need to do it. And what did Jesus do? He simply said, he didn't disagree with Satan. He didn't, he didn't debate him or anything. He simply answered him by quoting Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. There's something else interesting about this area. And, and we talked about this before. In this whole area, there must be a million rocks out there, a little round stone that actually resemble very close a loaf of bread right out of the oven over there. So he, had, he, he said, Satan suggested, made, made a sense. It actually made sense to, to, to me and to, to everybody else. He said, Jesus, why starve yourself? I mean, do it. See, hunger represents human wants. We want, we want, we want. See, it's not a matter of refusing supernatural help, but it was a matter of submitting to the Father's will and timing in all things. That's exactly what Jesus was focused on. Why start yourself? So he withstood that test right there by that statement from Scripture. See, the Lord's timing is much different than ours. We've talked about this many times before. And the scripture says that his thoughts are not our thoughts and, and his ways are not, not our ways. So the timing is much different than ours. Satan whispers in our ear, do something. Jesus, show your faith. Do something. Use your power. And God says, be patient. Be patient. It's like the man I read about that who prayed, Lord, is it true that you to you, a million years is like a second. Yes, the Lord answered. Wow. Is it also true that a million dollars is like a penny? Yeah. Well, Father, could I have a penny? <laughs> Jesus said, sure, just a second. You see, this is what Jesus said, be patient, be patient, be patient, trust me. And, and this is exactly what he was doing with the Father. And then it said in Scripture, it is written. See, Jesus was willing to fight this battle as a human because the humanity in Jesus, he was willing to fight it as a human. Why? You see, you understand, Jesus could have blasted Satan uh, to another planet. He could have put him into orbit right there. But he chose to fight as a human. Why? He resisted in a way you and I can understand. And you know what's amazing? All this resistance is available to you and I. We still can do that ourselves. We have the same access to the same scripture, to the same way that Jesus did. Simply quote scripture and fight your battles that way with the help of the Lord. We can effectively resist temptation in the same way that he did. We counter Satan's lies by God's truth. Now, if we're ignorant of those truths, guys, we're poorly armed for battle. Keep that in mind as we, as we do that. We're, 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 full, we're, we're, just, we're just not armed for the battle if we're ignorant of the truth of Scripture. Tony Evans had a real uh, good way of, of putting this. He said, why did God test his son this way? Well, the Bible described Jesus as the second Adam or the last Adam. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says this. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the first Adam is from the earth, earthy. The second is from heaven. This whole, this whole idea that, that he's saying here, the first Adam was tested in the garden. Here, here was a beautiful garden. I mean, it was perfectly calm. There was no sin. There was no problem. There was no weeds. There was nothing. They were perfectly harmony, in harmony with God. And the first Adam was tested in the garden by the fruit. You know the story. And he gave in to Satan. And he got the human race kicked out of the wilderness. 
kicked out into the wilderness, should say. You see, the second Adam went into the wilderness to defeat Satan so that he can escort us back to that garden, back to that place of perfect peace, perfect calm. Let me just uh, bring you to some kind of conclusion here that you see, fasting is one of the most neglected spiritual disciplines, I think, in, in our lives. We hear stories about fasting, but most time when we hear stories about fasting, what is it connected to? It's connected to, to uh, it's disconnected actually from some spiritual practice. It's not because we're trying to get close to God, we we're trying to get in harmony with God. It's because hunger, their hunger strikes to provoke authority some way. There's someone in prison that's on a hunger strike for something going on there. It's to draw attention to social issues, another reason why that people, uh, people fast today. But we know a different reason why we fast. Someone named Richard Foster said this, a great definition of fasting. He said it's the voluntary denial of a normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. The voluntary denial of a normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. Fasting provides a short-term opportunity to intensely focus on our relationship with God. That's what it's all about, lock, stock, and barrel right there. It allows us to intensely focus on you and I's relationship to the Father. See, Satan wants you to focus on your needs. <laughs> he wants you to worry about why you don't have this, why you don't have that. Why do you want to call God out? Because I'm a child of the king. I should have this. Well, in this world, I don't think we're guaranteed too much in this world. Now, now many people today in, in society think, think we're owed something. We're not owed anything in this life, God. We're owed only in our lives to honor our Father in heaven. And to do those things that he's called us out to do. See, instant gratification, self-preservation are rampant in our lives. That's what we want. We want that instant. And in, in this techno world, if you ever notice how your patient runs thin, when you're you're on your iPad or computer and the thing a thing lags about two seconds, you wonder what's wrong with this thing. We all do it. It, it, it's, it's the world we've come in, and, and so that's, it's rampant in our lives, guys. But by fasting, we can rise above our self-indulgence. We can, we can set aside a time when we commune with God on a spiritual plane. Now, is it only by food? Do we deny ourselves by food? You know what I've seen in the past, uh, some on Facebook? I, I see this note, and, and to me, I just say, thank you, Lord. Someone says, I'm going to step away from Facebook. Wow, this is getting too, too wild for me. I'm going to step away. Well, guys, that's fasting. You're stepping away from something that's interfering with your life, interfering with your relationship to the Father. It can be any number of things like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be denying yourself from food. Most time we think it's about food, but just maybe stepping away from Facebook for a time is a spiritual discipline. And we know that it could be healthy most of the time. All right, well, that's all we have for today. Uh, I, I thank you for coming today, and we'll, we'll do it again next week. So let's pray that we'll be dismissed. Our Father, please continue to, to show us our need to set aside a personal time with you, to just be quiet and listen. Lord, if we're talking all the time, we, we'll never understand what you're trying to tell us. So help us just to be quiet and meditate on Scripture and see Lord, how do you want us to, what do you want us to get out of that verse we just read? And stop and read it again, read it again, read it again. And continue to ask God to show you what he wants to teach you through that verse. Lord, how much better off we'd be in our lives and in our community and especially before you as a child of the King. Lord, may you continue to bless this day with your presence and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you folks for being here again today.